In this video, we explore an idea called the particle in a box. So to begin with, the particle in a box, even though that's how it's always uh, described, I think that's a misnomer. We're not looking at a particle in a box. We're looking at something that has characteristics of both a particle and a wave, constraining it in a box and seeing what we can learn about that. With the wave behavior of matter is something that's introduced in chapter six, and we have the de Broglie equation describing the wavelength for matter. We're going to move on to look at uh, models that include atomic orbitals for the hydrogen atom, and we're going to be maintaining this description of the electron having characteristics of a wave. One thing that we saw in section 6.4 was we can calculate the wavelength for matter if it was an electron. When we calculated it for a macroscopic object like a golf ball, we'd see that uh, they still have a wavelength, but they're extremely short. The idea of using waves to describe an atomic model, what kind of waves are we looking at? We're looking at standing waves. So most general chemistry textbooks will describe what a standing wave is. A few of them will move on to consider a standing wave when it's on a, uh, a ring. That's what the de Broglie model is. And then other textbooks, Petrucci and Atkins are two examples, or the physics textbook Knight, then go on to consider the model that we're looking at here, the particle in a box, and use that as a precursor to show how quantum mechanics works. Within this video, we're in this space right here. We want to see how the de Broglie equation gives us insights when we place a particle that has both particle and wave behavior in a 1D box. So why are we considering this model of a particle in a box or a particle in a wave in a box? Well, first of all, we're going to begin by using a simple model to learn how matter behaves if it also has wave-like properties. There's other models that would provide other insights. So there's examples of placing it in a 1D box, a 3D box, on a ring, or what's called a harmonic oscillator. This is a very common approach within physics or physical chemistry. Let's take a simple model and then see how it applies in other settings as well. But this is something that we infrequently do in a chemistry class. So that's one stumbling block that students may have. Why are we looking at this particular model? Most of the time in chemistry, we look at very specific examples, such as bonding for uh, the hydrogen within H2, or the atomic energy levels in the hydrogen atom. So we usually, within a chemistry class, have a very specific problem that we're seeking to solve. The approach in physics is different, or in physical chemistry. In those cases, we take a generalizable model that we can analyze and then see how it applies in other settings too. So that's one thing we want to be aware of as a potential stumbling block conceptually for our students. There are real world applications. A uh, few are listed right there. So this particle in a box is not an abstract model that will never have applications. There are chemistry applications. The same model it will be investigated in using quantum mechanics. So we're using a simpler approach first to see how matter behaves if it has wave-like properties. And the findings from this will also be investigated using quantum mechanics. We find that this particle in a box model, the insights that we get from it, will explain other topics that we come across within general chemistry. For example, the standard molar entropy increases as the math increases for, quote, quantum mechanical reasons. That's what most textbooks would say. What are these quantum mechanical reasons? Quantum mechanical reasons come back to this wave-like description for matter. So I feel like we need these particular insights if we're going to try to answer those other questions, offer these broader explanations. So let's start with the particle in a 1D box. So that's what's being shown there. What does everyday experience tell us? Well, we can pick a particle with a given mass and put it in a certain size box, mass M, length L. Everyday experience tells me that that particle could be anywhere in the box. It could be moving, it could be at rest, it could have any speed, and any kinetic energy as it moves back and forth. So one equation that we're going to be using within this discussion is the kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. 
That's what my everyday experience tells me. We're going to add to it now that matter has a wavelength. So we're going to be saying that we're not simply placing the particle with a mass in the box. We're going to be accounting for its wavelength. And we'll be using our de Broglie equation describing the wavelength. Now, we've been looking at uh, waves for quite a while now. If we were to take this, which of these waves would we say has the lowest energy? Which has the highest? So pause for a second. If we were going to place those in order of energy, this would be my ranking. What I'm looking for this within this is not the amplitude, I'm looking at the wavelength. Longer wavelength is lower in energy. A way of describing this when we're placing it in a box, I'm going to go to this FET sim right here. So within the FET sim, what we have here is we have a wave going up and down, up and down. This is the box that we're placing it in right here. So you notice at the ends of the box, that's where the wave is fixed, and we see it oscillating up and down, up and down. This particular wave corresponds to this bottom energy level, lowest in energy. Next. Next. So what that sim is doing is showing us the different particles that when we place them in a box, what the corresponding wavelength is. So within my setting right here, that wave I'm looking at is what's called a wave function. So these are the different energy levels in the box. This would be the lowest in energy, next, next, and that's what's corresponding to these different lines. So take a second, make a prediction. What do you think corresponds to the next line? What would the wave look like? Let's check and see if you're right. So we'll go to the next one. This was uh, the first, the second, the third, the fourth. So in each case, our wavelength is getting shorter and shorter as the energy goes up. And we can see that that would continue on for different waves. Now, if we look at these energy levels for a second, we've seen energy levels, descriptions of energy levels before. This is from a different sim, our models of the hydrogen atom. We have energy levels once again. Take a second, compare and contrast. How are the energy levels in the hydrogen atom different than the energy levels for our particle in a box? Well, if we look at these, they, again, we have specific values. That looks like it's the same in each case. But in this case, the energy levels are converging for the hydrogen atom. And for the particle in the box, they seem to be diverging. The reason why? Well, our hydrogen atom is including kinetic and potential energy. The potential energy is a Coulomb potential energy involving the attraction between the electron and the proton. This is a very important concern for us within chemistry. But our particle in the box, this is only describing the kinetic energy. So right away, we see that that's an important distinction. This idea of kinetic and potential energy was present in our Bohr model. It's present in the de Broglie model. Those both have the same uh, pattern right here. So one insight that we're having right away when we're looking at our particle in the box is the fact that by not including the potential energy, it's leading to a different spacing. The spacing of our energy levels when we're looking at the hydrogen atom, a key thing is going to be this introduction of the potential energy as well. So in some ways, I find this to be a useful insight, not because it's present within our particle in the box one, but because it's absent. So let's explore the variables for our particular box and the particle in it. We could look at the mass of the particle, and we can change the length of the box. So if we go to our sim to do that, let's look at the mass first. We'll go down right here to our lowest energy. We see half a wavelength. 
we can manipulate the mass. So it's initially being shown as the mass of an electron. Let's look at, first of all, in terms of this representation for the wave. If we increase the mass, or decrease the mass, the wave itself, it looks the same in both cases. But what's being shown, changing certainly, are these energy levels. Higher mass, lower mass. As we take it to a lower mass, what are we seeing? We're seeing an increase in the energy levels, and we're seeing that they spread apart even more. So let's make a note of that. When we're manipulating the, the mass of the particle, this would be a smaller mass. We see that the wavelength wasn't changing, but the energy levels increased and moved farther apart. That's one insight that we have from our model. How about if we change the length of the box? So if we go back to our sim, let's change the length of the box. I'm going to be moving it closer together. Okay, I see two different things happen in this case. I'm seeing the wavelength get smaller. That makes sense because it still has to reach each end. End to end, that's where it's um, fixed. But the energy levels, once again, increased as it gets a narrower box, and they have the same uh, greater and greater divergence. So if we go back and summarize that, it looks like as we constrain the box so it's in a narrower and narrower uh, width, shorter and shorter length, we see that the wavelength decreases because it still has to fit end to end and these energy levels increased and move farther apart. So I want you to make a prediction. What would the energy levels look like if we have a large mass and the box is large? Take a second, make a prediction. What do you and then we'll check in this in. If the what will it look like when the mass increases and the box becomes larger? So I'll take it to the maximum mass I can get, and let's make it so we have a wide box. What did that mean in terms of the wavelength? It certainly increased, but notice how dramatically different the energy levels now look. Within our picture, the energy levels got closer and closer together as the width of the box increased. This is an important insight within our model. Matter has a wavelength, but in our everyday world, we need to make it so that both of these pictures are true. Both of these models are true. We need to see how they're somehow connected. Our macroscopic picture of what we experience every day, it doesn't appear that we have specific discrete energy levels. They seem continuous. How do we get there from our picture of the uh, matter having a wavelength? Is because in our everyday world, the boxes that our particles are in are huge. The boxes are huge, so even if matter has a wavelength to it, it sure seems like the energy levels are continuous. So this is another important insight for us within our models. These two have to reach the same answer in our everyday experience, and they do because the boxes in our everyday world are quite big. If we were to summarize a few of these, then for the particle in the box, we had a description if it's only a particle or if it's something that has a, both a particle and a wave characteristic. In our model, the only energy that we were interested in was the kinetic energy. When we had our hydrogen atom, we had both the kinetic energy and the Coulomb potential energy. When we place our everyday particle in a box, any energy was possible. But when it had characteristics of wave, it had restricted energy levels that diverged. The hydrogen atom also had restricted energy levels, but in that case, they converged. An insight from that is that our Coulomb interactions that seems to be affecting the spacing. That's something that we're going to end up looking at more as we look at uh, electron interactions with the protons and with themselves going forward. 
Another insight we saw was that the energy levels are closer together if the mass is large, if the box is large. So that's how we make sense of the fact that uh, the, these two have to end up giving us the same answer once we reach a macroscopic stage, because that's our macroscopic stage. The boxes that we're placing our matter in, it, matter in are, is quite large. Let's look at a little math to see uh, beyond these general descriptions how it fits together. So we have the equations um, from earlier for the kinetic energy and for the de Broglie wavelength. Let's add one more to it. If we're setting up a standing wave in this 1D box, the condition has to do with the length of the box and then the wavelengths that we can fit into it. So for a box, the wavelength would be that we're going to fit in order to have a standing wave wave would be twice the length divided by some whole number, one, two, three, etc. So we can have uh, half of a wavelength, one wavelength, one and a half wavelengths, etc. That's what it means when we're uh, hit the condition for the standing wave. If we look at a description for the wavelength in terms of the de Broglie wavelength and then this condition, we can solve for the momentum. As Knight describes it here, it leads to, quote, a most surprising result. The momentum of a wave-like particle can only have discrete values. N equals 1, 2, 3. We can't have it equal 1.25. Let's take it now and solve for the energy. So the energy is the kinetic energy. So if we do a simple manipulation within that, we can see what the allowed energy values now are. Knight goes on to say, this conclusion for the energy is one of the most profound discoveries of physics. Because of the wave nature of matter, which has ample experimental confirmation, a confined particle can only have certain energies. It is simply not possible for the particle to exist in the box with any energies different from those given by this equation. Goes on and looks at a few implications for this. There is a minimum kinetic energy. You can't have a kinetic energy value of zero. So this implies that the particles must always be in motion. This is a profound finding as well that most students uh, haven't realized. Our particles of matter must remain in motion because they have this minimum kinetic energy. We also see in the equation the different relationships that we explored previously in terms of what does it mean to have the energy levels depend on the mass and the length of the box. I like to run them first in the sim and then seeing how that they're consistent with the uh, mathematics. And the mathematics, once again, it might look complex within this page here, but they're not. We're really combining just three equations, kinetic energy, de Broglie wavelength, and the condition for a standing wave in the box. This description of the energy, um, here's how it appears within the chemistry textbook Atkins. Same derivation, uh, the same description here of saying that energy is quantized. Students have commented and found that this analogy to be quite helpful of comparing what does it mean to have something described classically in a quantum mechanical description of energy. Uh, you can read it within that, but most students say that analogy they find really helpful, so that's a good one to add to your own toolbox. If we look at uh, how this plays out with some calculations, this is back to night. So we're looking at the energy um, for what night calls about the smallest imaginable macroscopic particle and an electron. So in both cases, we have a description in terms of the mass and then the, the cell that we're placing it in, the box that we're placing it in. Here's the corresponding math when we're looking at this virus. This is being solved for the n equals 1 energy level. If we're looking at the energy difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2, we find that there's a change in energy um, being expressed here in terms of electron volts. Is that large or small? That's a really small gap between the two. If we follow up the same thing for the particle, the electron, it's a much uh, smaller mass, much smaller box, and look at the difference between those, the difference becomes uh, much, much larger, many, many orders of magnitude larger. 
This reinforces the idea that for macroscopic objects, even the smallest that we can imagine, the energy levels sure seem continuous, where it, when we're looking at the realm of things like electrons, they're not. We have a difference between them. Quantum mechanics is relevant when we have our particles that have a much smaller mass, and we're placing them in much smaller boxes. Here's two descriptions of the same phenomena here from Atkins. So uh, this is on the left, the same thing that we saw within our sim. And then on the right, a description here of uh, looking what happens if we change the uh, length of the box. Students comments within this one, I find interesting. So here's a, a comment a student made within per perusal. As the end value increases, the gaps between the energy levels also increases. In the hydrogen atom, though, they converge. Why the difference? They go on to ask, is it because the electrostatic interaction between the electron, is it because of the electrostatic interaction between the electron and the proton? Absolutely. So what they are uh, asking is, is it due to the fact that we have a potential energy present? They nailed it. So this is both a really good question and then a really good hypothesis for what they think is going on. Comment for the one on the right. I'm having trouble understanding what L means in terms of an atom. Uh, I think that's a really good question as well. So what they're, to me what they're saying is here's a generalizable picture. You put a particle in a box. Where does this have parallels with everyday experience? What chemistry problems are we going to seek to solve and how do they fit in with this description of a particle in a box? Excellent question. So within this video, what we've done is simply introduce the model, the particle in a box, and the particle, once again, was quite different once it also has characteristics of a wave. The same findings from this are going to be used to illustrate how quantum mechanics works. But even in its own right, I think it gave us important insights that tell, tell us how things behave in the strange, strange realm where particles have both, uh, it's relevant that the particles of matter also have a wave characteristic.